Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to start the webinar on dam removal. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the participants who've already arrived this morning. I see there are a few of you who were uh, following our previous talks as well. But for the ones who are new here, my name is uh, Eve Silver, and I work for Wetlands International European Association. Um, and together with the Italian Center for River Restoration, we are hosting a series of talks on, on river restoration and different topics. Um, the, the way it works is um, our presenter will give a talk for about an hour and afterwards we will have uh, time for questions and answers. Please type your question later on in the, in the chat box on the right of your screen and then I will read them to the presenter who will, now, who will answer the questions. Um, we will close this session an hour and a half from now. Uh, and uh, for now, I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, Bruno Boss of the Italian Center of River Restoration, um, who will uh, give an introduction as well. Thank you, F, and good morning to all the participants. I am Bruno Boss, and uh, I'm part of the Italian Center for River Restoration. Uh, a no-profit association dealing and promoting river restoration in Italy and, of course, uh, in Europe, uh, starting from 1999. CIRF is uh, also part of Wetland International European Association, and uh, we are very pleased to co-organize uh, this uh, series of uh, seminars dealing with uh, river restoration. Um, today, uh, we have uh, this uh, first uh, e-seminar concerning dam removal step by step, part one, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, the speaker, which is Paolo Fernandez uh, uh, Garrido, on behalf of uh, World Fish Migration Foundation and Dam Removal Europe. Paolo, I hope uh, you will better than me. Uh, you could explain better than me. The, the aims and the actions of uh, this uh, organization to promote uh, uh, river connectivity. Uh, Pao is a forestry engineer and uh, she worked and studied uh, in, in Spain, but also uh, she spent a part of his career in Massachusetts, in the USA, working on fishway evaluations, on uh, planning, uh, and uh, designing fishway and also dam removal. Now she is very active uh, in uh, this uh, World Fish Migration Foundation, and I think is the perfect speaker to to talk uh, uh, about uh, dam removal. Also in practice, uh, she will uh, give us some uh, good uh, example of best practices and also some very practical information concerning, for example, permitting processes, uh, costs, how to cover this cost, uh, for example, from relevant grants. And also, uh, I think she will uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, database concerning uh, um, dam removals in Europe. I see that uh, all the examples are from USA, Spain, uh, United Kingdom, Sweden, and France. Not Italy, but I know in Italy we have very few examples uh, at the moment of dam removal. So we are very uh, interested uh, in, in your talk and to, to see examples from other countries. So the floor is for you. And thanks again from uh, CHIRF and Wetland to, to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. I hope you can hear me well with no echo and uh, and high enough okay so um first before i start talking about dam removal in um, in other countries and our project and removal europe i would like to um oops i would like to introduce uh my foundation the, the foundation i work for wolfish migration foundation and the projects we work in we work uh, in projects all related with um with uh, river connectivity, river restoration. Uh, one of our main projects is World Fish Migration Day. Uh, World Fish Migration Day is celebrated every two years. And uh, in, if 
next year will be World Fish Migration Day. Two years ago, you can read all about uh, what we did in 2016. So if, if you go to our website and you go to downloads, you can uh, download the report. You will see that in the last World Fish Migration Day, there were celebrated 450 events in 63 different countries and many kinds of organizations uh, participated from um, NGOs, angling associations, um, environmental administrations, research institutes, um, schools, universities, and uh, the, the aim of uh, World Fish Migration Day is to reach the population and create awareness about the need of a free from rivers, healthy rivers, and, uh, and uh, to recover uh, freshwater fish uh, populations. So hopefully uh, you guys can also uh, join World Fish Migration Day 2018. Another of, of the um, projects we collaborate in is AMBER. I know it was uh, already very well explained in another e-course uh, the other day from Wetlands International. Um, um, but I was, uh, there are many goals for, uh, for this Horizon 2020 project, but I would like to highlight that uh, one of the most interesting part of this project is that we are creating the first atlas with all, well, with all, with all existing uh, uh, inventories. We are collecting all existing inventories in Europe. Europe is continental, so more than 30 countries, not only European Union uh, um, countries. And uh, we want to create an open access um, atlas to show all the, the, the obstacles in rivers. But of course, uh, all, we won't do uh, inventories uh, in the field because it will take years. We are collecting everything that exists now, and hopefully this will be ready in a couple of years. Um, and another of our projects, it's what we are talking today about, it's Dam Removal Europe. Dying Re you, uh, Remover Europe, it's a project we started last year in, in 2016. And uh, why we started that Removal Europe? Well, we saw, we, 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 we found out that there is much more being done in Europe than we, we ever thought. We, uh, we always hear all the achievements from the United States. Uh, they have removed many obstacles. And we have a lot of information from them, but what is going on in Europe? I mean, you, you, for 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 me, a few years ago, it was very difficult to find. Um, it was very difficult to find what is being done. And actually, uh, I was very surprised when I started collecting uh, inventories, uh, dam removal inventories in Europe. We found out that. We have removed more obstacles than in, than in USA, and we will see this later in the talk. So um, that's one thing that we 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 found there's many many things uh, being already done in Europe, and in we need to show this information. We need to share all this knowledge and experience, and we need to to be seen because that's another thing. Um, the population that this citizenship. You know, when you talk about dam removal, uh, it's like a taboo. It's like uh, people freak out. It's like it's like a bad thing. So that's another thing that uh, we need uh, to make people understand that this is necessary and many, many times is, is the best option for restoring rivers. Um, and we saw that in most of the countries, when they are dealing with the dam removal, the most uh, complicated part, sometimes it's not the technical engineering part, it's the social uh, part. You know, there are many people um, against it. And for example, I like to share these pictures with you. They are not from Europe, they are from USA, but they find these, these things, you know, when they are going to remove a dam, that the citizens, the populations, you know, fight against uh, their dam being removed. They even create some people uh, calendars with naked people in the, in their dam. Or, for example, my favorite one, uh, my favorite picture is: take a second to say goodbye to the lake. The mud hole you will see is sponsored by the nature, the Department of Nature Resources, so the administration. So, what is the mud hole? I thought the first time. What's the mud hole? They all look like mud flat, uh, mud flats. These are mud holes. So, citizenship. Uh, citizens think 
sometimes that when you remove a dam, this is what you're going to leave them in their, in their area, just this. So people don't understand the process of a dam removal and what are the benefits. So these are our main objectives for, with Dam Removal Europe project. Uh, first of all, create awareness in the general public and to uh, make them understand the importance of, uh, of free-flowing rivers and what, what it's a healthy river because people don't understand the impacts of a dam. They really don't. Actually, in, in the Spanish case, they think dams are, are positive for rivers. So we must uh, instruct and, and teach people about this. And also that dam removal is a good option. Now, it's not always possible, of course, but it's, it's one of the best options for river restoration. The second goal we want to get with dam removal Europe is to gather and to connect all these professionals working in dam removal because they are very isolated they, and they need to support each other. They need to share information. There's so much out there than, than we don't know about. So we want to create with Dam Removal Europe a meeting point for all this community. And also our third goal would be to put Dam Removal on, on the politicians and policymakers' agendas. As uh, so Dam Removal is a really good option for, for uh, um, river restoration and also to uh, encourage and to activate uh, the creation of fundings and grants for dam removal in Europe. So how are we going to do all this? Well, in uh, last year, we just started with our website where we want to, when we want to create the meeting point for the dam removal Europe community and where people can connect and can share uh, cases, studies, information, news. And we all already started collecting inventories throughout Europe for the dams that have been removed. And we do, we created, we, we do our workshop every year in different countries. So um, if you go to our website, I don't know if you see my pointer, if I don't know if you, see, you can see my pointer anyway. So if you go to our website, you can see there, you can read news, you can get our newsletter, which is sent once every two months. You can go and check the workshops that have been done in the past. So this was the first workshop being celebrated in, in Spain last year and our field trip. And this uh, workshop was in Birmingham this year. And you can go in our website to download sections and actually download most of the presentations and learn about what has been uh, talked and shared. Also, you can go to the section of case studies where we are in the process of updating and uploading a new interesting uh, uh, cases and studies. There are there are hundreds and hundreds, but we we little by little we're trying to select the the most interesting uh, ones, and we are in the process of creating an interactive map where you can see what has been done already in Europe. We'll see this in detail later on, country by country. Uh, as Bruno said, I will talk about uh, the permitting and the situation on their removal in, in um, France, in uh, Sweden, Finland, uh, Spain and UK. Why these countries? Because it's the ones that we have got information from. It doesn't mean that they're the only ones. Uh, I, uh, we've, we've learned that, for example, Denmark has removed many dams, but all their inventories are spread around in municipalities. So we would need to contact each municipality to get this information. So it's pretty complicated and maybe with time we can do that. Italy, we learned a, a couple of months ago that you have also removed a few dams, but we need to get this information from our colleagues and from interested people little by little. But we will, talk, we will focus on these five countries which they have removed the largest uh, amount of dams and we will see why, why they are doing this. So you can actually see, uh, you can actually go to the website and already check all this database. We are in the process now actually for France to get permission to upload their database. And we will talk about later in France on, on about their database. So, and what are we, and how, how are we going to um, continue on what are we going to do on Dam Removal Europe in the future? We are going to keep uh, improving the website 
and facilitated information. We want to actually also post references and works being done. We want to complete the atlas with uh, remove uh, dam removes and also possible uh, uh, dams to be removed in the future. Uh, we will continue with workshops every year. Next year will be in Sweden, and we want to develop a dam removal guide. Hopefully, it will be for free. You will be able to download it for free, and we want to share. Uh, good cases, studies, good practices about dam removal. When can you do a dam removal? The steps you need to take uh, by or not only permits, also technically, you know, to guide a little better person that would like to do a dam removal. We would also like to create a documentary, Dam Removal Europe film. Uh, so, so people, citizens start seeing dam removal as a normal thing and they don't freak out which this is something that sadly we see in many countries. And we finally, we would like to keep uh, searching for finance for the project and also to collaborate in at least nine dam removals during ne these next three years. So, which are the drivers for dam removal, uh, for dam removal, sorry. We, we know that the main resources are economical reasons, safety, legislation, and environmental reasons. You all know this, but this, the main uh, reasons uh, in a country, it, it varies depending on the country, and this is what we are going to see now. So I would like to start with the United States. Why? Because um, I think it's a really, really good model uh, how they manage removing their dams, how they get their money from it. I think it's really interesting. So let's start with the United States. The United States has over uh, six. Uh, 80, sorry, 87,000 uh, dams uh, inventory and um, really well classified. And, and why did they start, why did they start removing dams 30 years ago? Why? Well, in the 70s, you will see in this graphic, in the 70s, there were several dam failures which killed many people and uh, did a lot of, uh, did, did a lot of uh, material damage and, uh, and home damage and destroy. So what the government um, this decided, this led to the creation of what they call national dam safety programs. This was created in 1979 and is uh, administrated by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which they call FEMA in short. And what's, what's the objective of, of the national dam safety programs? Well, they want to avoid uh, dam failures. They want, they try to have uh, control on the on the safety or the, of their dams. So I believe that after the creation of these programs, uh, the dam safety programs, uh, each uh, state started to uh, uh, to create an office, dam safety offices, which they deal with all these programs, and later on. They created a nonprofit organization, which is called Association of State Dam Safety Officials, which this uh, organization helps to connect and uh, with all the dam uh, dam removal. I'm sorry, from all the dam uh, community, all the dam safety community. So, so they they really have a a really good uh, organization in dam safety, dam management, and, and dam removal too. And what do these dam safety programs do? They oblige, they make the, the owner go through an inspections every year, every two years, every five years, depending on the classification of your dam. So if you own a dam, you must go through an inspection. And uh, before, now you have to pay for those inspections, but before, it was dam safety who, who who supplied you a technician, a technician who would go to your dam and and do the inspection for you. But now you have to pay for it. This can cost you from five thousand to fifty thousand dollars each inspection. And after inspections, many times you have to you have to repair your your dam. So this costs you way much more money. So at the end, at the end you have to um if, if your dam doesn't give you uh, any uh, be any benefit um 
it's going to cost you a lot of money because you you need to maintain it. So so I didn't. Usually, owners um, choose to um, to remove their dams if they don't have any economical benefit. Because, but even even that it's cheaper. In general, in most cases, it's cheaper to remove a dam than maintain it. To remove a dam is not cheap. It's cheaper than maintaining it, and in the long term, but it's it's definitely not cheap. You have three different phases on the dam removal. You have the feasibility phase, the design and permitting phase, and the construction phase. Usually, the construction phase uh, it's up to 80% of the cost of the total project. Sometimes. Most of the time, sorry, most of the times. But in some cases, we'll see now that the permitting is so complicated that sometimes the permitting phase can be even much more expensive than the construction phase. So who owns uh, who owns a river in, in, in the US? This was very shocking for me at first because coming from Spain, Spain, all rivers are public. So, um, so when when I learned that you can have many uh, possibilities in uh, in the United States, you can all the rivers are private owned, and uh, you can have one owner for the whole river and banks. But you can have, as you can see, the second choice: you can have two owners, one for the left bank and the riverbed, and another uh, uh, owner for the right uh, for the right bank. And then you can have a third option, which you can have different owners for each bank, and then and then one different owner for the uh, riverbed. And then you can have a fourth option, which is um, which is you can, the the river can be divided in two, and you can have two owners. So in that case, the dam uh, would be owned many times by the by the two uh, river owners. And this case complicates everything even more, the last case, because if, if the river, if the limit of the ownership, okay, which is the middle of the riverbed, is the, also the limit of, uh, of, uh, of states, it divides the states, okay, then when we go to the permitting phase, you will see that you have to ask for the the permit from each state so you have double work it's really crazy so if in in in, in the left bank in the left uh, side if it's connecticut for example and in the other left bank is uh for example new york you have to ask for the totally different permits in each in each side of the of the of the river so which permits do you need to ask when you are going to go, when you are going to uh, to carry out a dam removal, well, first you need a local permit. Usually, you ask it in your county. Then you need at least one state permit. But this completely um, differs, uh, varies depending on the state. So in some states, you can just ask for one uh, permit, which usually is a dam safety permit. Uh, but sometimes in other states like Massachusetts, you need up to 11 different uh, state permits. Okay, so this completely is different in each state. Then you need a federal permit, at least one. And usually you ask it in the Army Corps of Engineers. Then this is not a permit. The next one is not a permit, but it's a requirement. Um, you, uh, you need to check the nature diversity database. So what is this? You go online and you see if your dam is located in any of those strapped areas. And you pray that your dam is not there. Because if your dam is there inside any of those areas, you have to call to the DEP, which is the Department of energy and environmental protection. You have to call them and ask them what uh, special measures you have to take. Why? Because in those areas, there are 
uh, protected, endangered, and protected uh, species. So you will have to take special measurements. The DEP, the uh, uh, Department of, en of Energy and Environmental Protection, will try to avoid telling you which species they are. So maybe they just tell you, okay, you cannot do your river works, your works between May and September, for example. But that's it. But sometimes, in other cases, they will have to tell you the species because, for example, if there is an endangered uh, clam in your reservoir, in your reservoir, which is artificial, it was created, it doesn't matter. If there is a, a protected clam in your reservoir, you will have to hire scuba divers, which will have to go there and pick the clams before you remove them. So in some situations, for example, that one, you have to, um, you, they will tell you the, the species, the species that, that, that you have to be careful about. And then the last permit, which, sorry, it's not a permit, it's also a requirement, is that within the next six months after, after the dam removal, you, well, you, the consultant that is doing the design and the assessment work, they will have to update the flood maps. They will have to send this to FEMA. So and this costs a lot of money, uh, uh, the updates of, this, of these maps. So who pays for all this? Because this, you have to pay for the feasibility phase, the design and assessment phase, the construction fa uh, phase. And, and there are many uh, dams being removed in this. So where does the, con the money come from? Well, most of the time is the owner who pays it because, as I said before, it's cheaper to remove a dam than in the long term maintain it, way much cheaper. But they have many grants and helps to remove dams. And this is actually the most interesting part from my point of view from USA. They really have different formulas to help fund these projects. So for example, when a hydroelectric company is going to ask for a relicensee of their dam, the, the organization who gives this per, to the license can, um, can um, discuss with the, with the hydropower company to, instead of paying a fee for the relicensee, maybe to remove one or two dams, owned by the, maybe owned by the hydropower company or, or not owned by them. That's one way. Another way is to uh, apply for grants and loads from dam safety programs because they do have money for this to help. Another um, uh, money can come, another um, economic helps can come from the holding backs of fines from environmental violations. So, for example, in Spain, if you if you are if you are fined because you committed a, a crime against environment, that money goes to what I call the common box, and it it ends up being it end up, sorry being spent for anything, anything, water bottles of a, a meeting and uh, for politicians, okay, anything. But in the United States, this money usually goes to a uh, holding banks where later on they will be spent to restore uh, environmental uh, damage. And another another grants can come from federal money, from for example uh, NOAA, or for example NOAA, sorry, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or from uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. Also, there are other uh, there are other sorry, I see people coming and leaving, and it's kind of distracting. So um, another fund comes from can come from state from state funding. And for me, I don't know if I got the pictures. Yeah, I got the pictures. For me, this is like one of the most, uh, the funniest, and but very br brilliant ideas. They have many, this is just one. For example, in the States, um, it's not like in Europe. Each time you buy a car, uh, the car plate is linked to the car, not to the driver like in Europe. So each time you buy a car, even if you use a used car, you have to ask for a new car plate, okay? So when you go to and, and ask for a, a car plate, uh, they, they ask you if you want a regular one or if you want to collaborate in any specific programs. And they have programs for 
salmonids, uh, fish pop uh, salmonids population recovery to restore rivers. You see in Colorado, protect our rivers uh, to recover the trout, like in Georgia. You have uh, so you can choose a nice uh, car plate, and then you pay a little bit more, and that money goes, you know, to, to for for these projects, which I think is brilliant. So they have, and they have many uh, different um, examples like these ones. So they have different formulas to collect money uh, to later on help uh, restoring rivers and, and remove dams. And they also have what they call match matching money, match grant funds, matching money, which is the work that a student or volunteer can do, but it won't cost you as a professional consultant, right? So uh, well, that's what we would call in Spanish dinero en especie, right? So it would be like an exchange. And this is really working very, very good. As you can see in this map from American Rivers website, for now, they have removed up to more than 1,300 dams. Um, and the majority, they have been removed since 1990s. So I think it's really it's really working great, is the, the way of working. And um, I think we can learn uh, some ways they have to, to collect money and to deal with uh, with these processes. I think it's very, very interesting. So, and in Europe, how this works in Europe? Okay, so we will start with France. Why France? Because uh, they are the European country which has demolished the highest number of, of dams. And, uh, well, and, and they are the country, one of the country with the highest number of obstacles too. They have more than uh, 95,000 man-made obstacles, which from those 95,000, 70,000 are weirs and dams. And uh, they have an amazing uh, inventory, very, very well, they, uh, very well done. And they update it every year. They, they have done an amazing, amazing job. And who owns, oops, sorry, this is my fault. Who, who, who owns the, the rivers in France? Uh, for my surprise, I thought it was like in Spain, you know, they were um, public rivers, but no, they're private too. They're, they're private and uh, most of the time are, there's only one owner, but you have the other option that you can have two owners up to the middle of the riverbed. You can have two owners, but there are a few rivers which uh, they are public, which they they call it the waterways, the big rivers. Okay, the rest of the rivers are property from from uh, from private owners, and um, and the fishing rights. The fishing rights belong to the owner of the river. And you will say, some of you will say, uh, of course. Well, that's what I thought. But no, we will see in UK, for example, they're separated, so you can own uh, a river. You you can you may not own the the fishing rights. Another person might might own them. So we will see that later. So who manages river in France? Well, the first time I asked this, I was uh, answered a lot of people, and I thought, well, a lot of people with what organization? A lot of people, and they were right. A lot of people. This scheme, I would like to say that it was uh, done uh, by a colleague, uh, Colleen Ronot from. A European Rivers uh, Network, which they are a uh, partner from Dam Removal Europe project, and uh, she made this wonderful scheme for me because I just never, I just couldn't keep reading about it, and I, I had such a mess of how things work there. It's very complicated. It's complex. Sorry, not complicated. It's complex, but they have a very well organization. Depending on the state, when I say state here. I mean the nations, not a state as a province in the United States, state as a national government. So uh, they have the, the state uh, organization, which is the French Agency of uh, Biodiversity, which until last year it was called ONEMA. And they, they deal with all water laws, the water, water framework directive, and they create their great databases uh, they have, okay? they. Uh, they they um they make sure uh they have all the correct uh water preservation laws and then they have 
the water agencies, which are the organizations who uh, manage the major uh, watersheds, okay? Uh, those are the water agencies. And then inside those water agencies, you have a smaller water basins and you have three different main um, organizations. And one of them, which is the one that I am are more interested in, are the DDT, the DDT. I cannot recall the whole name because it's in French, sorry. But these departments, DDT, I think was the Terri Department of Territory, or I forgot, sorry. So these uh, departments, there are up to 100. Um, they make sure that the policy is well implemented, that the, the works and activities in the, in the rivers are legal, okay? And they, they do, the, they collect the obstacles and they update the inventories of their uh, river obstacles. And then you have the local, uh, um, the local organizations like municipalities and associations who also deal with a river management. So it's quite complex, and uh, but it works. It works very well. And I wish uh, this is a, a screenshot of uh, of the of the uh, dam removal Europe map, interactive map. And you don't see the the dams removed yet in our map because we are in the process of getting permission from the authorities. Um, to uh, to upload their their uh, database, but not only that, we are going through their database, which you can actually download and see these incredible numbers, like fully remove obstacles uh, over two thousand four hundred and partially remove obstacles over five thousand seven hundred. But this is what we need to check because um, what kind of obstacles are they? Uh, are they uh, small weirs and dams? Are they also bridges and culverts? This is something we have to find out. And also, I believe that in those numbers, they, they are also included uh, obstacles that have been naturally removed. This means after storm. So before we upload the database, we need to clean up and organize well the data and of course get the permission from from the authority, but uh, but definitely I think uh, France is a is a great um, example for European countries. And I before I forget, they have um, they have grants, they have economic help to remove their their dams. They don't have a specific grant for dam removal, but they have a lot of environmental grants, and they can pay up to sixty, even up to eighty percent of the dam removal which is which is amazing and then i would like to talk about just very briefly the cost nobody has told me of course from any country how much a dam removal costs because they always tell me it, it varies so much it depends of all the the field work you have how complex and how big is the dam how complex are the environmental assessment or the permits in the, some countries, the permits have a cost. Um, so, uh, so, but in France, uh, in France, I've been told that the weirs removed in France, um, the cheapest examples, you can find them around 5,000 euros, from 5,000 euros, the small dams, up to, up to the, most expensive dam removal, which will take place next year, and is the picture uh, you see in the screen. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was confirmed uh, that uh, the the two biggest dams in Europe will be removed in France. Uh, I'm not sure how they pronounce it, but it's uh, the Venice and the La Roche uh, dams. Uh, they are at 35 and 50 meters, both in uh, in the Selum River, and I would like to congratulate all the, the, the people in France who have um, managed and uh, achieved uh, these dam removals, I think it's gonna be amazing. They have been, they, they, I have to point out that they have been studying the pre-removal, uh, they have been studying uh, 
they have been doing research study before the removal during five years, I think. But until two weeks ago, it wasn't really confirmed that the removals were going to take place, but they will next year. And then after the removal, they will be studying like five or eight years also. They will do be doing research studies. So I think it will be very interesting after all these years to see all their findings. So this is uh, for France. The next country in Europe which has demolished more uh, weirs and downs is Sweden. Uh, Sweden, uh, they have more than 10,000 dams uh, in uh, uh, recorded. Uh, they have different inventories and, and in three different uh, organizations, as you can see there. Uh, in, this, uh, in these inventories, they don't have exactly the same number, uh, but you know, so some of their and some inventories are, are missing some of the of the dams. So you, it's if you want to get the full overview of their of their um, obstacles, it's in, it's in, interesting to check the three databases. And um, and who owns the rivers in Sweden? All of them are privately owned. And the driver, the main reason in Sweden to uh, restore um, uh, uh, rivers and to demolish dams are all because environmental uh, reasons, all because of, of a water framework directive. It's the same as, as France, sorry for to point that out. In France, the same thing, Is that's the main reason, to reach a good ecological status for the water framework directive and uh, to, uh, to restore the rivers. The legislation that is stimulating this in Sweden is their national uh, uh, envir uh, environmental law, which is called the Swedish Environmental Code, and again, the, the Water Framework Directive. Who manages the, the rivers in Sweden? Because they're privately owned. Well, the owner is, uh, is uh, the responsible to manage uh, his or her uh, reach or stretch of the river. But if you want to do any activity that might impact uh, the interest of, uh, of a private or, or, or common owner, then you must ask for permission for, to the environmental car, court. Sorry. And when you want to do actually a dam removal, first you have to ask for authorization for the, to the Swedish County Administrative Board. I believe there are 21 uh, Swedish uh, County Administrative Boards. And if your dam removal is too complex or they believe you require more uh, permissions, you need to ask to, again, to the Environmental Court for these permissions. And all these permissions have a cost. Who pays for these uh, authorizations, for these permissions? the and for the dam removal usually the the owner of the dam do they have uh, any helps any grants in their country not specifically for dam removal but they have grants for for environmental restoration so that they they can get money from the government from the municipalities and of course from ngos and for, and of course for the european union um but i think the most interesting thing from sweden is that they are in the process of the proposition of creating a grant to help remove dams, funded so money coming from hydropower companies. I think this is really interesting. I don't know if it will end up happening and they will end up creating this, but but I think it's the the most interesting thing. And the cost, again, nobody has really told me how much is costed all their the dam removals and the weir removals they have done because they vary a lot. But again, we are talking about a few, a, a couple of few thousand euros to, to millions again. So it really varies depend of, of all the work you have to do in the field, the permits in this case that cost money, the design work. So you can see in our website that uh, thanks to this specific uh, county administration board that I cannot definitely cannot pronounce the name of that board but thanks to the GIS technicians and uh, from that board they have facilitated us and collaborated facilitating us their uh, uh, 
uh, dam removal database. When I say dam removal, sorry, I just call it dam removal, but it's also weirs. And I think here, very little obstacle also culverts, I think too. So, uh, and they update this database yearly. So it's, it's, it's a really, really nice database. And the next country with most uh, obstacles removed, it's Finland. Finland has removed uh, at least 450 obstacles. And uh, the institute that um, managed these records is the Finnish Environmental Institute. But uh, I was confirmed that this number can be maybe doubled. I mean, they might have uh, removed double uh, up to 900 or 1,000 obstacles. But why don't they have that number? Because they haven't updated yet all their, their databases, their inventories. But uh, they have been doing this for a few years. And what is the situation in Finland? Well, first, the rivers are privately owned, as well as most of the lands and lakes. And the fishing rights are not automatically included in the river uh, ownership. So uh, usually they are high, uh, handled separately, but sometimes it overlaps and the same owner of the river has the fishing right, but not always. And what are the drivers to, to what are the reasons to um, remove dams in Finland? The main reason is to recover uh, migratory fish stocks for recreation and tourism. That's the main objective in Finland. There isn't any specific legislation that stimulates dam removal, but there is a, a, a national fish passage strategy to improve migratory fish stocks. So this helps the decision, the, 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 uh, making the decision of removing dams. So uh, so they they are doing. This is actually uh, very, I think, very efficient. And uh, and who 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 decides to remove dams in in Finland? Well, usually the um, the management uh, authorities. And who manages rivers in Finland? Well, the ELI centers, who are the Center of Economic Development, Transport, and Environment, and which are, I think, they are up to 50, 50 uh, uh, centers. In, in Finland, and also the hydropower companies. The hydropower companies uh, who own the river, they manage their, their stretch of the river they own, and the stretch of the river also the impact. So, um, so there are two, uh, let's say it's, it, there are two uh, persons, there are two institutions, well, not institutions, that manage rivers, the hydropower, uh, uh, owner and the ELI centers. And who do you have to ask for authorization if you want to go demolish your dam? Well, first you have to uh, to ask for the ELI center opinion if they think you can remove the dam. If your dam is uh, if your dam project is uh, simple and they decide that you don't need more permissions, you just you don't you don't have to ask for more permissions and you can go for it and do your assessment work and but you don't need any specific permission but if the e ally center decides you need permits then it costs you money and you have to to go to the a a v i centers which are there are six in finland uh, there are state regional administrative agencies there are six even although there are three main ones from those six and they will tell you which permits you need, what studies you need to do, do to do. And these permits, of course, uh, they cost money. And who pays for all these dam removals? Who have been paying for all these dam removals in Finland? Until now, the ELI centers have been paid for these dam removals. So this would be uh, uh, the country uh, state money, state country money. But now, from now on. Uh, the stakeholders, so the interested people, uh, must collaborate and they must be get engaged on the on on the cost too. There are no grants or any help in Finland to, that I have found 
of, of to remove dams. And the cost can go for the minimum that I have been told is 10,000 euros up to, I think, the, the most expensive um, dam removal, which will take place in two years in the city of Vanta and will cost up to uh, 800,000 euros. So that's for Finland. And now Spain, which will be the fourth country which have demolished more dams officially. Well, say officially because now we'll, later we'll see uh, UK. Officially in the records, it's Spain. So what's the situation in Spain? In Spain, there isn't a national uh, inventory of obstacles with all the obstacles, only the big ones, only the big dams. So in the national uh, dam inventory, you can find up to 1,200 uh, dams. But that's, we have much more than that. We have, uh, if you go uh, authority, a river basin authority by river basin authority, Uh, Pau, you're, I can't hear you at the moment. Not yet. I think your microphone stopped working. Oh, no. It's back. It's back. Okay. It's back? Yes. Oof. Okay. It's, it's back. back. Okay. I, I didn't do anything. My God. Okay. Thank goodness it came back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, Please thank continue. You, Mike. Yeah. Okay, so now I see the time, so I must go fast, uh, faster. So in Spain, if, if we, we, we collected uh, through a long uh, a year, the inventories from, uh, from the river basin authorities, not all of them have, um, have inventories and the ones that have inventory, they are very incomplete. We went up to uh, the number of a total number of uh, 26,000 obstacles, but that's way far from reality. In my estimation, my personal estimation after collecting all this is that at least, at least we have doubled. So at least we have 50,000 obstacles. And, and who owns these obstacles? Who owns the rivers in Spain? How this, uh, how this works? Well, rivers, are public owned. I thought this was more uh, usual, more common, but no, not, not that it's not that common. So to, to have uh, in a whole country uh, public rivers. And uh, what's the main driver for removing dams in Spain? River connectivity to reach good status of, um, of the water bodies for the water framework directive. That's the main goal. And uh, do we have uh, any national legislation uh, to stimulate this? Yes, we do. But uh, in, from my point of view, all this, leg this, this legislation have not really been successful. I mean, I think we have a wonderful legislation, but uh, it hasn't, nobody has followed the law. So I think that you can have the best law ever, but if you don't have somebody that is there, you know, checking and uh, controlling that everything is being done correctly, Nobody will do it. And this is, I think, the Spanish case, sadly. Because in our law, it says that if you want to use the water, you know, for irrigation, hydropower, whatever, you want to uh, build a dam, that's fine, you build a dam, you use the water for your benefit. But when you're done using the dam, where you're done finishing the river, uh, using the river, you must take that dam out. And the owner must pay this. Well, nobody has done this in Spain. So that's why I say we have really good law, but we haven't done anything until now, thanks to the Water Framework Directive. And uh, who are the responsibles for this? Who are the responsible to, to implement the Water Framework Directive? Who are the ones who manage rivers in space? There is Spain. They are the river basin authorities. Uh, I will go more into deep to this, but I don't have time. So sorry, I will go faster. So uh, to whom you have to ask for authorization if you want to remove your dam? To many organizations, to the river managers, which are the river basin authorities, uh, to uh, to the protected area manager, managers, if your dam is in a protected area, in a national park, you know, or in a community uh, area of interest, or 
any of those protection uh, figures. You also have to ask to the flora and fauna managers, which uh, belong to the autonomous region uh, government, and you usually have to ask for a construction permit, which you have to ask to the city hall or the municipality. All these permits are free of cost, but the assessment study that you have to, to, um, to have they of course cost money, but the, the actual permissions are free of cost, but it takes a long time. And who pays for all these dam removals? This is what I, I told you before. The dam owner should be the one who pays for, for this dam removal, but this has almost never been this way. Uh, the majority of the dam removals in Spain have been uh, paid uh, with, uh, with uh, government money, with river basin uh, uh, authority money. We don't have any specific um, grants to help funding these, um, these projects, of course, apart from uh, European Union money that you can, you can ha get from uh, life projects or whatever, but apart from that, we don't have any economic help. How much these uh, uh, weirs and that removal cost in Spain? The cheapest weir removals I've been told have been 3,000 euros because you have to see that you don't have authorization and permit cost, right? And only assessment cost or construction cost. So if it's very, very, if you have a very simple weir, it can be very cheap. And what it has been the, the most um, the, the most expensive case, it has been uh, this case in Madrid province, in Robledo de Chavela municipality. This was uh, down uh, demolished in, in 2014, and for until now has been the, the highest dam removing in, in Europe. It's 23 meters high, and um, that has been the, the 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 most expensive dam removal in Spain, and with a lot of permitting, a lot of the studying. And anyway, we could talk for an hour about this dam removal. Sorry about that. So UK, UK. Sorry, I was only able until now to uh, get this map from all obstacles in England and Wales. So you don't see Scottish and Northern Ireland uh, uh, obstacles here. And you can see that they have over 22,000 obstacles mapping in the UK. And they have a really, really good, uh, sorry, UK in England and Wales. And they have a really good inventory. Uh, very, very pretty complete and uh, very well done too. And how does it work here, uh, the, the, the permits and everything? Well, it's very, very, very long uh, to explain because uh, it's different in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. So I tried to concentrate and summarize everything in this slide uh, because if not, we will take hours for, for UK, but it's really interesting. Uh, there is one thing very interesting that we will go at the end and it's the funding. A Scotland, I will I will uh, say it first. A skull in case in case a, 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 um, stops me uh, before I, I finish. A Scotland is the only country in Europe that I found they have a specific grant to restore their rivers, and it's called the Water Environmental Fund. Uh, and this uh, with this fund, and this year in 2017 they have. They, they, their budget is decided by the government each year, and this year in 2017 they had up to 4.6 million pounds, if I remember correctly. And um, and, in, and with this fund, you can uh, apply for this fund if you want to remove your dam. Uh, I think it's really, really interesting, but you will see later that Scotland has demolished until now that we know uh, nine, uh, nine weirs. They don't have as many weirs as England and Wales, so nine weirs is a, is a good number, but they have removed more this year and we are about to, we're close to get the updates from them. So anyway, let's start. Who owns the rivers in the UK? Most of them are privately owned in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but there are cases where the owner is a city or a town. So these rivers could be seen as, as, as public, right? But usually they're privately owned. And the, the, the most uh, curious thing here 
for me is that the fishing rights uh, are not the same as the river rights. So you can own your river and another person can own the fishing rights. It's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. So, and who, what are the main drivers in, in, in England, Wales, and Scotland to uh, Northern Ireland to remove dams? Um, mostly because of fish passage, because of water framework directive. But in Scotland, it's mainly because of fishing interests, because uh, uh, recreational and angling uh, uh, interests for Scotland. Who manages rivers in, in, in these countries? In England, it would be the Environmental Agency, in Wales, the Natural Resources uh, Wales, in Scotland, the Scotland Environmental Protection Agency, and in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Environmental Agency. Do they have to ask for permits? Yes, a lot. All of them have to go through different permits. In England, the, uh, the most important one is called the Environmental Permit. And uh, inside those permits, uh, one of the authorization uh, you need is the impoundment. One of the licenses you need is the impoundment license. This means that uh, before you remove your dam, you have to advert. You have to go to the environmental agency and say you will want to remove your dam, and you have to advertise it. You have to advertise it for a period of time so your neighbors, the people upstream and downstream your dam are aware that this weir is going to be removed in case they want to object, they have any objections, because uh, maybe their, their water uh, their um, water abstractions um, uh, depend on this weir. So they must find another, uh, another source of water abstract abstractions. So uh, this would be the, the most important license. But they have many, uh, many licenses to ask for, as well as in wells. The environmental permit in Wales, it's more or less called flood risk activity permit, and they have a lot of authorization also to us. Then in Scotland, you also you have to ask for a CPA for the Scotland Environmental Protection Agency permit, and you have different permits too. And in Northern Ireland, same thing, but you don't have to ask for the permit only for one uh, organization, like in England, Wales, and Scotland. You have to ask for to other also other organizations to to ask for this permit. In Scotland, will be first up uh, to um, to a CIPA, uh, Sorry, to CIPA, first to the local uh, planning um, organization. Then it would be to uh, to DAERA, which is the Department of Agriculture, Energy. Well, I forgot all. Sorry, I forgot all the. The, the name, but it's the Department of Agriculture and then the Department of Infrastructure. And mostly those three organizations you have to ask for, for uh, permitting. And these permits have cost for, to all of them. Who pays for dam removals in these countries? Most of the time, it's never the owner. In Scotland, if it's a big company that is, it still exists, like a hydropower company, it will be the hydro company who will pay. But the, the dams and the weirs that have been removed have been paid thanks to the grants. And in Northern Ireland, there haven't been any weir or dam removed yet in Northern Ireland, but there are plans to remove a few. And in their cases, admin associations or charity with charity money, they will pay for, for these uh, removals. And uh, for the funding, uh, for the funding, in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, there are environmental grants that come from the government, that comes from uh, charities, but there's only one from Scotland who has a specific uh, grant for river restoration. And the cost varies a lot. In England, the majority of the weirs removed has cost less than £10,000, uh, the majority. In, um, in Wales, it varies a lot from less than 10,000 pounds up to uh, the the most expensive one, I think was 200,000 pounds, I think. And in Scotland, the nine uh, weirs that have been removed, all of them have, have cost more than 50,000 uh, pounds. And in Northern Ireland, they haven't removed any yet. Hopefully they have removed uh, more. And 
here when you go if you go to um to our website you can see that england and wales have removed in their records they have they have removed uh, more than 129 obstacles but the truth that they have been told that this number is much bigger but not everybody uh, um, uh, updates these records so uh, they think they they can double this number the real the real number is double and in Scotland as I said before nine obstacles so um, thank you so much. I think I missed some information maybe, but as one hour talking, uh, it's just for me, it was a lot. It was the first time I talked so much, I think. Well, thank you so much. And if you have any doubt, if you have any doubt that today I might not know, um, please, when, uh, when Wetlands International uploads uh, this uh, uh, presentation in YouTube, if anybody's interested in any specific thing, please ask in YouTube. So I will try to answer you, or I will ask the river managers from that specific country to answer you. So actually, maybe we can have a discussion and uh, we we can uh, solve all the doubts that you have in case I am not able to answer you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. And yes, indeed, we will um, upload the, the recordings of this presentation and also the slides to our website uh, later today. So if you want to look back and find some of the information, and if you have any doubt, please contact yeah. Paul or please, please contact us, and we can also uh, yeah. put it through. Um, so wonderful for, thank you for all these uh, examples and the comparison in between countries. Uh, which was really interesting. Um, I'd like to open uh, the the chat for the any questions you may have. Please type them in this um, in uh, in the chat uh, function to the right, your screen. Um, and in the meantime, I uh, I would like to ask you. Um, you showed us how the ownership of the dams and the barriers uh, works in different countries. And do you? Do you know how the different ownership influences the dam removal process? Does it make any difference whether it's privately owned or state owned? Completely, completely. Um, for example, uh, in the UK, in England or Wales more specifically, um, uh, we were told that um, uh, the, the private uh, the dams and we are privately owned. Uh, usually, people reject to remove any of of their weirs. They are really attached sentimentally because of their history, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't want to remove their 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 weirs at all. So when they are publicly owned, if there is a town that owns a, a dam or weir, because they need to go through inspections and maintenance because usually they're bigger uh, weirs. If they, if those dams are not being used anymore, or you know, by the town, they prefer to get rid of the of the weir or the dam because they don't want to keep paying for this cost. So they're open to to remove dams, but not in a, a not pri a not private owners. And in, um, for example, in Spain. In Spain, same thing. If the weirs are are um, privately owned, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult sometimes to make them uh, to make them remove their dams. But the public, the ones that are public owned, it's it's much easier, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's the uh, I, I assume um, the private owner. Uh, uh, Will be will be approached to remove the dam, and there will be a lot of talking uh, and sharing information about the benefits or the uh, the disadvantages yes. of this removal. Yeah. All these countries, when they are uh, going to do a dam a dam removal, they do a huge effort for for um, social and public meetings. They do to explain them why they are going to do this. They they. And, and I, I have to say that I really admire uh, English and Willish uh, cases because they have removed a lot of weirs 
for the difficult situation they have because uh, owners are not obliged uh, to, to remove their dams at all, not even for safety reasons. Actually, they if they have a big dam or weir, uh, for safety reasons, if, if the dam is not being used, they have to dewater the reservoir, okay, to empty it. But they don't have to actually remove the the dam. So um, so yes, uh, they all of them they do a lot of uh, do a lot of effort for to reach the public and to tell them why this is important. Yeah, yeah but it's still it's 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 very difficult. And um, I would like to say something. It's is very curious. On a public meeting in Spain a few weeks ago, I was asked something. It was it was funny because when I was showing the map of the dams removed in Spain, if you remember, well, you won't remember, but I I, I don't know how many slides back it is. But if you half of Spain, northwest of Spain, you would see all the dams removals in northwest of Spain. In a, in the southeast of Spain. There was not. There was only one dam removed, or we removed, and there was somebody in the audience that asked me, "Why is that? What, how come all the dams, uh, um, all the dams removed are in the northwest?" And uh, this is this is because the um, the water, the river basin authorities, okay, who are the managers of the rivers, Spain, they have been. Uh, uh, managed by mostly always I have been managed by civil engineers okay not by hydrologists uh, uh, biologists you know uh, forestry engineers so they have been managing uh, rivers in the state just like canals just like canals so uh, that's why in many parts of Spain you don't have rivers anymore you have canals yeah. And so that mind, that type of thinking is changing very little by little. And now the new generation, you know, it's now understanding that we, we must uh, manage our rivers in a different way, not like anything else. So if you see the map, the, you see the, the old minded uh, managers, you know, that haven't really, are not really into dam removals. You see, you can really see in the map where are those uh, river basin authority and where are those uh, watersheds placed? You know, yeah. so um, it's it's really interesting. It's also uh, it's also a social mind thing. You know, you will need generations, I think, to 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 completely understand how positive this is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We have a, a question from Carolina who's asking, um, what are the main constraints of dam removal? What prevents more of them being removed in the UK? What are the main constraints? You mean the main problems to remove dams in, in yeah. UK? Well, why are there? That the, yes. Uh, the, uh, what I've been told is that the, the, mo the most difficult part to remove a dam in the UK is society. They are really attached to their weirs. We have been told that people, some people say, no, uh, you know, in this weir, uh, the battle of the war 300 years ago took place, or no, uh, in this weir, my great great grandfather used to swim, literally. So for them, uh, weirs are wonderful. They are wonderful, and they are really attached, and and it's long-minded for them to remove a weir. So uh, it's crazy talk. So for for river managers, this is the most difficult the most difficult part, not the engineer or the technical part at all, not at all, is the so, uh, the social part. Yeah. 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 Um, Nareth uh, is saying, um, uh, since the webinar yesterday, um, uh, I'm feeling confused. And yesterday we had a, um, uh, a webinar uh, by Gustavo Gonzalez from the Iberian Center for River Restoration who talked about the uh, ecological and social restrictions of dam removal. So what actually the shadow side of uh, dam removal. He says, uh, Narad says, I've learned that dam, uh, dams cause irreversible damage to an ecosystem, but now it seems that dam removal could recover ecosystem. What if the dam developers suggest that it is okay to build a dam now to generate electricity? and serve economic growth. And after that, we can remove it later because the ecosystem would be able to be restored after a while. 
uh, and the business is done and the dam has been aged. Um, so she, I, I understand, I didn't see, I did, sorry, I didn't watch that uh, webinar from Gustavo, but um, um, there are certain cases, that's why in, um, in, I think in the beginning of my talk, I think I said that not always you can remove a dam, not always, it's not always possible because uh, at least in, uh, in watersheds that have been very deeply managed with a lot of history, like in Europe, the rivers have been modified so much. We have so many obstacles that if you remove one, you would disequilibrate the, the, the system. That's right. And that sometimes happens. That's why you have to do an assessment study. But most of the times, and maybe Gustavo doesn't agree with me, but most of the times, um, removing a dam, it's positive. It, it really is because you, the, the sediments and the nutrients get blocked behind the dam, right? So you have a deficit of, of sediments and, and nutrients uh, uh, downstream. And uh, deltas are affected to these. They don't get all these sediments to the delta, so the deltas shrink. And uh, of course, for a fish passage, it's, it's a big problem. And for water quality, and for many, many environmental reasons. But, um, but definitely, if you do a, a correct assessment study and you see that you won't have problems of scour and incision upstream, because sometimes that happens when you take out a dam, if you do, don't do a correct assessment study, uh, you can have uh, erosion problems upstream, head cutting, okay? And maybe if you have a, a, a structures, construction upstream, they can even collapse. So it's true, you have to be careful. Uh, but yes, uh, usually, most of the times, dam removal is, is, uh, is uh, very positive. It's true that depending on your dam and the quantity of sediments you, you have, you, you have to do a different uh, planification, for example. Yeah. If in the LOA, I don't know if you have heard about the LOA uh, dam removal in Washington state, the, the biggest dam removals in, in, the, in the United States, um, they thought in the first, uh, uh, first time to remove those dams in different phases because the quantity of sediment was humongous. So they thought, oh my, you know, we let's relieve this little by little. But then they thought, no, better, they, they thought, no, they studied it would be better just to release everything at once. So the impact, because of course, having millions of tons of sediments going down the river, it's, it, it damages, right? But it damages it once. Mm -hmm. And then you have to study that your river will be able to recover, yeah. right? So it, it really depends on the cases. It's yeah. done removal, it's a different world. This is also what Gustavo uh, tried to highlight yesterday, that it's a case-by-case -case approach. And his focus was mainly on the impact of uh, invasive alien species, which uh, are benefited by dam removal. So this was a specific focus also of his presentation. Um, but of course, um, in each case, you need to uh, analyze the advantages and disadvantages whether or not to remove the dam. So yeah, that's, um, that's true. And we have a question from Ivan who's, who asks, um, does the foundation plan to expand activities to other countries? And I think he refers to the Dam Removal Europe uh, uh, project or initiative. You showed us example okay. of these countries. And, if, yeah. Okay, if he, if he means that if Dam Removal Europe is going to expand to other countries outside Europe, because this is for Europe, right? We will be, we are focusing on, on Europe as a continent, not only European Union, okay, as a continent. But worldwide, if he means worldwide, not that removal Europe uh, project. We are thinking about doing a project uh, worldwide, you know, that can actually uh, collect and network and connect all experts worldwide. Uh, but that would be a much bigger one, and we are in the process of of uh, constructing that. Yeah. Okay. So 
we'll wait and see what happens uh, with the expansion. Yeah, uh, Joao is asking, um, um, it is daunting to realize the lack of knowledge on the existing river obstacles across Europe. Um, he has experienced it firsthand. Are you aware of any grants or programs on how to get an accurate perspective on river obstacles all around Europe, uh, for example, or to say development of inventories? And maybe I can also add that um, um, to this question, uh, you showed us an, uh, uh, the example of Spain and that there was no national inventory of the obstacles there. Um, Wetlands International has uh, produced uh, an inventory for the whole of Spain earlier this year. Um, but this is just one example of an of a inventory done by, by one organization. So it wasn't uh, a national database of the government in Spain. Um, yeah. but maybe Pao knows about more of these initiatives. Well, um, it is Spain. Sorry, I would like just to, to say, say a comment. We do have a national base, uh, database, but uh, what I said is that it's only with big dams. Yeah. Okay, so I don't consider this really a, 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 a river obstacle national database because you only have big dams uh, higher than 20 meters or 50 meters high, right? And most of the obstacles we have are lower than that. So in that database, you will find 1,200 obstacles. But as I told you, if you collect all the regional databases, we have up to 26,000. And again, that's completely... Uh, uh, far from reality, we have more than that. For your question about if there is any grant to create um, uh, to create your uh, database and to do the inventories of, of in your country, I'm not aware of any. But I, I really, I really don't. But um, but if I ever uh, run into one or somebody writes me, I will put it in YouTube in this uh, in, in the comments of this um, presentation. Yes, so also an invitation to participants to share any information they have on this. Yes, yeah. yes. Also definitely. afterwards, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's welcome. Um, Giancarlo from, uh, from TIRF is uh, saying um, about the dam removal survey criteria, uh, what about considering dam breaks intentionally not recovered as dam removal cases? Intentionally could be a key factor. In Italy, we have several cases of dams that have failed and afterwards not been rebuilt. Because dam removal itself is a cost, in some cases, it may be better just to let the river do the job itself. And it could be a viable option, even from a social perspective. What do you think about this issue? <laughs> so if I understood correctly, because the, the question was very long. Yeah. Um, um, if I understood correctly, is that if uh, if we are taking into account dams that have breached naturally, that have they have or intentionally, he said Inten intentionally. Yes. Yeah. Intentional, they have breached intentionally, but also naturally, right? Yes. If no. um, what he means is um, not maintain the dam and just have it breached yeah. by the river itself, but intentionally yeah. not maintain it so that the dam will break by itself. With, okay. And then you don't have um, the costs of removing it. Okay, so uh, that's a that's a really good question because actually we are in the process of deciding what to do with this because in France I know we have those cases in the French database which is huge uh, as you saw they have uh, over 2,400 dams fully removed but we know that uh, uh, many of them were naturally removed and some of them uh, intentionally breached. We when we have this information, we will make distinction. I think it's important to make a distinction when a dam removal was planned, you know, and have that process, and when uh, it was naturally uh, uh, um, uh, collapsed, you know, it, it, it broke. And if it was intentionally removed, uh, sorry, breach, I can tell you that the the um, the example I gave you for Spain, the last example, which I told you, this is the most expensive uh, dam removed in Spain and is the highest in Europe for now in Madrid province. That um, dam was not planned to be removed, but somebody intentionally one night broke the gate. And then 
suddenly they had an emergency situation because that dam was full with contaminated uh, sediment. So they had to do the dam removal planning super fast and they had to start the work very fast. Mm -hmm. That was the cause, but they couldn't leave it just like that. Okay, at least in Spain, many of you all were talking about a, a small weir, maybe you can do it. I don't think it's safe to do that, but maybe you can do it in some cases, like the one that I told you in Madrid province, they had to act and to do something, right? And they had to remove it in a plan and control way and to get those sediments out of the reservoir before they kept going downstream. So in that case, it ended up being a, um, a planet dam removal. So in the inventory, it's it's a, a normal dam removal, uh, intentionally removed, even though it started being intentionally breached, okay? but. If we, to answer your question, if we ever get those distinctions, those uh, differences, we will point that out. But for now, we are in the process to see what we what we do. Yeah. So it could be a matter of safety, and uh, uh, it might be a yeah, way to do it, but it has to be a safe uh, option, of course. Definitely, definitely. I mean, you cannot just, hey, somebody intentionally breached this, and then you leave it there. Yeah. That's Usually, you shouldn't uh, do that, yeah. Okay, many thanks. Um, I have no thank other you. questions uh, okay. that came in. Okay. Um, I would like to okay. thank you, Pao, for this uh, wonderful presentation and your very clear answers. And thank you to the participants for their uh, questions and for being here today. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, uh, this afternoon at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time, we will have a second uh, talk about dam removal uh, the technical side of it um, with uh, uh, Laura Wildman from the Princeton Hydro. Um, so please uh, join us this afternoon as well. And please find this presentation uh, uh, online later today. So thank you again and uh, hope to see you all back today. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well,